Welcome back to the Top Notch Documentaries YouTube channel. Jason Derrick Brown is currently on the run and had been featured on the FBI's Top 10 Most Wanted list until earlier this month when he was removed from the list. Despite not having been captured, his spot on the list was replaced by Michael Pratt, a man who ran an adult website which featured underage girls being forced to do things on video. It's probably not the best thing to talk about on YouTube, and so I won't go into detail on that case. Anyway, Jason Derrick Brown has eluded the authorities since 2004, and his story is interesting and puzzling. It definitely provides a look into the cautionary tale of seeking external validation, monetary gain, and a party lifestyle. All of these themes are relevant to this day, and all are powerful forces which can have people doing crazy things. So, here is the story of Jason Derrick Brown. I hope you enjoy. Jason Derrick Brown came from a decent family and spent his younger days in California. From an early age he had the silver spoon in his mouth and his family were highly supportive of him and his other siblings. Jason spent much of his time surfing and lapsed up the sun in Orange County. He attended Laguna Beach High School in Orange County and by all accounts his early life was cushy and normal for someone living in that region of California. Jason graduated from high school and became a Mormon missionary, probably because his family were heavily active in that community. He landed in Paris, France and spent some time there, becoming fluent in French. Eventually though, he returned to the States and got married before a major event impacted his life. The year was 1994 and Jason's father, John Brown, vanished following a trip to Mexico. He had been there before and his dealings in Tijuana were highly suspicious as he always returned to the States with lots of cash. These unexplained trips were likely tied into some form of organised crime but nobody knows for sure. What is known is that John failed to return home and his car was found abandoned in Texas sometime later. According to close friends of Jason's, this event altered his personality and he went off the rails. His previous Mormon lifestyle went out the window and he was now deeply interested in acquiring money and portraying a rich lifestyle to those around him. Jason spent the late 90s and early 2000s living on friends' couches, not contributing to the housing rent and essentially living a nomadic lifestyle, moving from city to city. He could show wads of cash despite not having a legitimate job and law enforcement is confident that he was making money through various scams at this time. These scams helped him to finance his expensive taste in vehicles, clothing and the activities that he engaged in. They helped him garner the attention that he desperately craved, that approval that many are seeking. He flaunted his possessions and loved to be in the spotlight. The scamming trend has become popular in recent years and thankfully, Jason wasn't active during the time of social media because he surely would have been posting everything for the world to see. Jason's known scams managed to fool everybody around him for a long time as he displayed the image of a party animal who gambled in Vegas and took trips whenever he wanted. With this lifestyle, everyone assumed that he was wealthy. It was in Austin, Texas that he and some pals set up a scheme to con college girls out of money for a modelling scam. All they had to do was get some photographs taken and pay Jason and his pals $500. Promises of future success in the modelling world had these girls eager to sign up, and they fell for the con. It is unclear just how much money was stolen from these girls. Jason can be seen in videos drinking, hanging out with good looking women, and partaking in trips out on boats and jet skis. He was obsessed with golf, and him and his brother had actually been caught running a scam at a golf club, stealing expensive clubs whilst one brother distracted the clerk. For this, Jason had been caught and his fingerprints were taken upon his arrest. This petty theft would eventually come back to haunt him less than five years later. In May 2003, Jason would move to Phoenix, Arizona and moved into a rented house. Continuing to live his outwardly flashy lifestyle, he impressed his neighbours with his free expensive and standout rides, all of which turned out to be leased cars, which he had been avoiding paying for a long time. He had defrauded the bank, and frequently gave made up addresses, PO boxes and information. Jason did anything to avoid having to splash the cash, despite being known for doing exactly that. These small time scams had been paying, but with a criminal record and no legitimate source of income, Jason was limited with what he could do. 
He was beginning to run out of money and with his false displays of wealth, I'm sure that the pressure was getting to him. The bank was looking for him and he was getting desperate for money to continue to cover his lifestyle. It wasn't cheap and he no longer had a wife, probably because of his time spent trying to fool everyone around him and his time spent showing off. He told neighbours that he was an importer-exporter of golf clubs to Asia but was cagey on the details of his wealth origins. Still, Jason was a nice guy. He invited neighbours to days out on the lake in his boat and every day out with him was an adventure. He was a fun guy to have around and always bought drinks for everyone on nights out. As Jason began to stress out and become desperate, his actions showcased what he had planned to do next. Jason left Arizona in 2004 telling a neighbour that his brother's wife has cancer and he needs to head back to California to support them. In early November, he travelled to Salt Lake City, Utah. There he attended a four-hour firearms training class, but with little experience in that field, he wasn't all that great. At the end of the class, he purchased a smaller, much more easy to conceal 45 calibre Glock Model 30. The pistol is very powerful, and Jason being new to firearms, was given the suggestion to buy a 9mm. He refused this advice and brought the 45 calibre pistol. Alongside this, he purchased two boxes of powerful ammunition before setting off to prepare for his grand plan. Somewhere along the timeline, Jason had planned to rob an armoured truck. He had his sights set on a Phoenix robbery location and began scouting out a strip mall where cash pickups were made on a regular basis. He spent his time taking down important dates, information, and did excellent recon on the armoured truck cash pickups. When he wasn't doing this, he was in the desert practicing with his firearm, becoming proficient with it and shooting paper plates. It was now November 28th and Jason was at a national forest in Arizona shooting these plates. During the shooting practice, he almost shot a young boy and his father. A bullet had hit the man's truck and upon him realising that he had done this, he apologised profusely and gave the man his information to compensate him. He actually gave his real information which surprised me, and adding to this, Jason told the man not to remove the bullet from his truck. Jason felt confident in his abilities, I'm sure. He had trained with the firearm for a number of weeks and was ready to commit a brazen, broad day act of violence that would shock the community and place him where he'd always wanted to be in the spotlight. 24-year-old Robert Keith Palomares was training a new recruit for Dunbar Armored Security. Like Jason, he was originally from California but was now working at Dunbar Armored Security in Phoenix. Keith's job was to collect money from different businesses and it was Monday, the day after Thanksgiving. It was going to be a busy shift for him and the new recruit. At around 10am, the recruit drove into the strip mall and Robert exited the truck to walk over to a cinema to collect the money. It could range from anywhere between five and six figures. This time, it was $56,000. Not surprisingly, Robert was armed and was fitted with body armor for his own protection. However, he was not aware that a man wearing a black hoodie and shades was lying in wait, desperate to cause harm to him for the sole purpose of taking the bag full of cash. But for now, he waited for the right moment. He needed the bag to be full first. Robert entered the cinema and returned out swiftly with the money bag. Out of nowhere, Jason stepped out of an alleyway and proceeded to fire his weapon, striking Robert five times in the head. No words were spoken and no time was given for Robert to process his situation. He hit the floor, still breathing but barely holding on to life. Meanwhile, his partner was sat in the truck, unaware of what had just transpired. It wasn't until a member of the public ran up to get his attention that he realised that his partner had just been ambushed. Company policy prevented him from leaving the truck, and so he called up Dunbar, and police arrived within minutes. In just a short space of time, Jason had taken $56,000 and taken the life of Robert Palomares. It was a brutal and unprovoked crime. Thankfully, one person recalled seeing someone riding from the scene on a bike following hearing the gunshots and this bike was spotted shortly thereafter, discarded in a bush in an office building parking lot. The bike was sent for forensic examination and one fingerprint was found. Within a day, the name of the suspect came back. He was 35-year-old Jason Derrick Brown. Investigators had his name and did their research into him. He wasn't your typical criminal. He had a petty theft charge 
but wasn't someone who you'd pick out as being a violent criminal. Police assumed that his motive was financial. The crime reeked of desperation. Once carrying out the carefully planned and premeditated crime, Jason ditched the bike in the bush and drove his BMW to a gym, where he showered and changed his outfit. He then drove to his Las Vegas storage unit and hid his car, changing vehicles. He took his Escalade to California, unaware of the progress of the investigation. He was certain that he had gotten away without leaving any traces. He resided with his sister and acted normal following the crime, depositing thousands into his bank account. He spent time with his brother David and they went shooting and golfing. The whole time, the authorities were getting ready to arrest him. They knew that he was in California and they had enough evidence for a conviction. Unfortunately, one bad decision costed them severely. On December 6th, a press conference announcing Jason as the man who shot Robert was put out to the public. The case was high profile by this stage and many demanded justice. Jason must have gotten wind of the news and fled before the authorities swooped in for an arrest. Jason travelled south, heading for Mexico many theorised, but he never made it there. His father having disappeared from there many years prior may have put him off. Or this may have been part of his plan to fool the police. Whilst on the run, Jason actually sent the man from the shooting practice incident $1,300 for reparation costs and an apology note. This behaviour puzzled the authorities, who matched a bullet fired on that day to the same gun, belonging to the guy who had just coldly snuffed out Robert's life. He had many different sides to him, and this made him even more dangerous. Jason would park at an airport in long-term parking and his car would be discovered around a month later. This airport was in Portland, Oregon, and investigators then learned that Jason had sent two packages to his family. They had been sent from both Portland and San Diego, and they contained his home videos, phone, and all different personal items. Jason was saying goodbye, and authorities believed that he was getting ready for a new life with a new identity. David Brown ended up getting a felony obstruction charge relating to the case. His punishment for cleaning out his brother's Las Vegas storage unit was probation. Pretty minor given the severity of the crime that his brother is accused of. Now for the question that I'm sure everyone is asking. Just where is Jason? Some believe that he made it to the US-Canadian border, crossed and headed east. Jason is fluent in French and Eastern Canada has a high population of French speakers. Others feel as though he's gone abroad into Europe. With his level of high education and international business degree, he could thrive abroad. Many other people feel as though he's still in the US and some even believe that he reunited with his missing father. I don't buy that last theory but I do feel as though he's still in the US, living under an assumed identity. In 2008, someone who had gone to missionary school with Jason spotted him at a red light. The man was shocked and Jason sped away. This was in Salt Lake City and Jason is probably living a pretty open life under another name. In April 2020, a possible sighting of Jason in Mansfield, Ohio was put forth, although this hasn't been confirmed and there isn't much information on this tip. What has been confirmed is that Jason's behaviour for the crime that he stands accused of was super brazen. He doesn't seem like someone who could just go underground and not integrate with other people. He has past connections all over the US and someone is probably aiding him, fully aware of his true identity. Hopefully, Robert's family can receive justice in this case. Jason has been on the run for years and has been ultra successful in evading capture. Will he ever be caught? I suppose that only time shall tell. This has been the story of Jason Derek Brown. As always, thank you for watching.